Okay, we're good. So. As long as you press the button on, on the side. I got a green light up in here, so we're good. Okay, fantastic. All right, so here we go. So let us begin as we begin all good things. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, as we come into your presence, we thank you for the gift of our Catholic faith. We thank you in a particular way for the gift of the Eucharist, of your body and blood, soul, and divinity uh, that you give us to nourish us as food for our journey. We ask that during this evening you may open our hearts and our minds, that we may receive your holy word, uh, and that we may learn all of those things that you wish us to learn about your uh, sacramental life of your church. And we ask this in the prayer which you have taught us, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Our Lady Queen of Peace, pray for us. St. Terribius of Mongravejo, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So when we were looking at the calendar, usually we do this class on the Mass a little bit earlier in the year because so many people who are kind of reconnecting with their faith or uh, they want to become Catholic, they want to know all the things, especially about Mass, right? Um, but uh, in the kind of catechetical tradition uh, of the church, kind of teaching about the Mass tends to come a little bit later. And so this year we were able to do that. Uh, and I really wanted to do this class because it is my favorite thing to talk about. And I can talk about the Mass ad nauseum, you know, for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. I won't do that tonight, maybe. Um, but uh, it's actually a really wonderful opportunity uh, for me personally to be with you tonight because today is my 31st anniversary of becoming a Catholic. So 31 years ago, I was in uh, the St. Mary's Greenville downtown, and I was received into the Catholic Church by profession of faith and confirmation and received my first communion. Uh, and it was the best decision that I ever made. Uh, and um, part of, the th of what was so important in my becoming a Catholic was actually the Mass, was watching Catholics at worship and the reality of the Eucharist. And so because of that, I wanted um, more than anything else to be able to come to Mass and to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Now, so let's go ahead and get into it. Um, in John chapter 6 in the Bible, Jesus does something which is really quite shocking. The day after miraculously multiplying five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people. You remember that story from the scriptures, right? He reveals that he is the bread of life. Now, you may be sitting there tonight and thinking, well, he also says a lot of things, right? He says, I am the door, right? I am the vine. I'm all kinds of other symbols. So, is his saying, I am the bread of life, just another symbol, just like all these other things? I mean, obviously, he's not a door like the door that you came in, right? He's not, you know, a little green thing that grapes grow off of. Well, this is different. He not only calls himself the bread of life, he speaks of his flesh and blood. What does he say? Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He's revealing that the supernatural divine life is related to his body and blood. And he tells his stunned hearers that they are to consume it. Now, it is hard for us sometimes to realize the reaction on the part of his listeners to this. Right? Remember, the Jews were absolutely and utterly scandalized by this. Because for them, contact with blood made them impure before God. It made them sinners, right? Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, right? You have, you know, this poor man that, you know, has been mugged, he's on the side of the road, he's bleeding out his eyeballs, and, and you have all these people that, that walk by. Well, the priest walks right on by, okay? The Levite, who is the helper of the priest, walks right on by. Well, why? Is it just because they were like, I can't be bothered with this guy? Well, no. It's because had they had physical contact with this man's blood, they would have been, according to the Mosaic law, rendered impure before God, 
So this is something that the Jews took extremely seriously. And here is this Jesus guy who's sitting here saying, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. They're like, okay, this, this is crazy, right? Now, John chapter 6, verse 66. I've always found that kind of interesting. We've got 666 for this verse here. Uh, now, remember that you know the division of the scriptures into chapters and verses was something that happened centuries and centuries after the composition of the scriptures. But anyway, that verse tells us that at this preaching of Jesus, many of his followers left. It was something that they were like, okay, Jesus, I'm tracking with you up until now, but this, that, that's, okay, that's too much, I'm out, I'm done, right? Now, here's the interesting thing, though, is that uh, did Jesus run after them and say, hey, guys, come on, I was just a symbol, don't overthink this? No, he didn't. He let them go. And even the disciples that were left were kind of scratching their heads, right? They were not sure what all of this meant. So, hello, yeah, come, come, come. So, good. Hey. They just did not know what all this was supposed to mean. Now, what Jesus reveals in John 6, remember that so often in the scriptures, our Lord reveals something, and then later on, the disciples begin to realize what this is all about and how this all kind of comes together. So what Jesus reveals in John 6, finds its fulfillment only when he asks to eat the Passover meal with his disciples in a rented upper room. Now, again, it's kind of hard to imagine what his disciples thought when they saw him share what was obviously bread and wine with the words, this is my body, this is my blood. But... They were able to see that action in view of what our Lord had already revealed. So when we talk about the Last Supper, the Last Supper was the institution of that mystery by which our Lord gives us his body and blood under the veils of bread and wine. And when he says, do this in memory of me, He institutes the sacred priesthood by which this memorial will be perpetuated. So on Holy Thursday, Maundy Thursday, the institution of the Last Supper is actually the institution of two of the sacraments. The sacrament of holy orders, do this in memory of me, and the sacrament of the Eucharist. So that's why, again, for Catholics, this is extremely important. And we'll talk about this and a little bit even about the history of, of Catholics' kind of understanding of this. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, okay, well, you know, the Last Supper was on Holy Thursday. Sure, okay, well, that makes perfect sense. But the Eucharist is a lot more than just Holy Thursday. It's more than the Last Supper. Remember what happens as soon as that sacred banquet was over, you know, what do, we, what do we read? They go out into the Mount of Olives, right? Jesus begins his passion, which leads to the cross. And on the cross, our Lord offers up his body and blood to the Father as a sacrifice in atonement for the sins of the world. The same body and blood that had been given the night before in the first celebration of the Eucharist. But of course, you know your scriptures, that's not the end of the story either, right? Because Christ rises from the dead in three days with a glorious body. So when we talk about the Mass, right? It's not like a tableau where we kind of reenact the Last Supper. There's much more that's going on there. Because the Mass unites Holy Thursday's Last Supper, Good Friday's Crucifixion on Calvary, and Easter Sunday's Resurrection into one Paschal mystery. Now, when we hear that word paschal, that's our kind of Latinized version of a word that we know from the book of Exodus. Remember the Passover, right? The Passover of the liberation of Israel from Egyptian bondage, okay? So when we go back to Exodus and we read about the Passover, it appears as a type of 
as a foreshadowing of the definitive passing over of all of humanity, of all of us, from our captivity to sin through the cross of Christ to paradise regained and restored. Okay. So when we talk about the Mass, the thing that I want you to kind of go away from this is it's not just kind of like, oh, well, we just kind of, you know, remember the Last Supper, right? Um, it's so much more than that. Everything that is present in the Paschal Mystery becomes present to us in the here and now. And that's why the Mass is so important for Catholics, okay? We're going to talk more about that. Now, when we think about the cross of Christ, it's important for us to think of this, you know, if, if you want to kind of see this as how Catholics view this, that what is so amazing about what our Lord does on the cross is that he's two things at the same time, which ordinarily can't be the same thing at the same time. Okay, what do I mean by that? He was both the priest who offered, him, who offered the sacrifice and the victim, the sacrifice that was offered, okay? Now, I want you to think about all the sacrifices in the temple, all the sacrifices in pagan religions, right? You've got to have a priest. What a priest does is he offers the sacrifice. That's what it means to be a priest, right? Um, and then you have a sacrifice. You have turtle doves, you have goats, you have bulls, depending on what religion you are, right? Uh, you have cereal offerings, all those kind of things. But Jesus is both the priest who offers the sacrifice and the sacrifice itself and the victim. So for that reason, from very early on, you know when you go to Mass and you have the bread that's used for the Eucharist, right? So we don't just kind of call that bread, right, bread that we use for the Eucharist. We have a specific term for it, and it is ostia. We use the Latin term, a host, which means victim, right? The author to the letter to the Hebrews, which is traditionally assumed to be St. Paul, tries to explain to his Jewish readers how Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of and the end of the ancient sacrifices of the old law, ushering in a new covenant of grace. So, the men who were deputed do this in memory of me, who would be called priest, and the Greek word that's used for that is presbyteroi, which means elders. Okay. They would participate in the one priesthood and the one sacrifice by representing. Okay, I, I don't want to say like representing because that makes it just sounds like a like a symbol that doesn't really have anything to do with it. Representing the Paschal mystery through a service, right, through a rite, through a ceremony, which is a true memorial, okay? It is remembering the past, but it's a lot more. It is a true sacrifice made present in the here and now. Now, there's a family that I am the godfather for all of their children, and they're big sci-fi people. And I am not a sci-fi person, just not my thing, but that is like their thing. And so I remember asking them once about their conversion story, how they became Catholic. And they're like, Catholicism is just like science fiction. And I'm like, really? That's not what I want to hear. I said, what on earth are you talking about? They're like, well, yeah, it's like science fiction. It's like traveling back in time, right? So when we are at Mass, we are present at the empty tomb. We're present at the cross of Calvary, and we're present in the upper room with the disciples at the Last Supper. Or to look at it not traveling back in time, but all of those things that happened back then becoming present to us in the here and now. Now, the earliest name for the gathering of the Eucharist on the Lord's Day was the fractio panis in Latin. That means the breaking of the bread, right? In the East, it came to be called the divine liturgy, okay? And in the West, it began to be called the Mass. Usually Catholics in the West, in, in the Latin West, call it the Mass. And that is basically just from the Latin for the last words of the service. Remember when the deacon turns around and says, uh, the Mass has ended, go in peace, right? Okay, ite misa est, go you are sent forth. And I find that that's very interesting that we call that whole service by the last words of it. Well, why? Because we're supposed to take what has just happened in the Mass and then bring it forth to the world, bring forth the fruit of our worship 
to the world, to our mission field. Now, sometimes people ask, you know, and I find all of this endlessly fascinating because if I'm a nerd about anything, and as my staff knows, I'm a nerd about a lot of things, um, the thing that I am the nerdiest about is the history of the mass. Like, how do we do all these things, right? And how are they done at different places in different times? I can't get enough of it. I've been studying it for 31 years um, and continue to study it and discover more and more interesting things all the time. Now, the reality is we actually know very little about how the earliest generations of Christians celebrated the Mass. Okay? This drives someone like me crazy, right? Because so often there are things in the Mass, and I'm like, where does this come from? Right? But think about how the Christians in the earliest centuries, they just, they just they were who they were, they did what they did, right? They didn't feel the need to kind of, uh, you know, write an, instructor, an instruction manual for it, right? Now, ancient texts show that as the church codified the canon of Scripture, okay, remember when you talked about the Bible, right? So where does the Bible come from? Like, what are the lists uh, that of the books that are in the Bible, and how does that come about? So as the church was going through this process of codifying the canon of Scripture, readings from those books were included, and they were included on a cycle. It was kind of like, okay, well, every year on this Sunday, we're going to read this particular reading, okay? Now, this word Eucharist that we hear, that we talk about, um, comes from the Greek word for thanksgiving. So sometimes I, I like to tell people, I said, you know, it's like having... Thanksgiving Day every day, right? We give thanks to God by this special way. And the bishop, the successor to the apostles, okay, would pray a prayer of thanksgiving according to some kind of generally accepted models, which early on became fixed. The priests con celebrated with him. And then they would take pieces of the leftover Eucharistic bread to the parishes where they celebrated a reduced form of the same service for those who couldn't be with the bishop. Okay? Now, by the time that we get to Pope St. Gregory the Great, who was the Bishop of Rome from 590 to 604, the basic structure and prayers, as well as the calendar of the liturgy, was substantially set in Rome. When I talk about the calendar of the liturgy, um, you know, we come to church and we ha we're celebrating now the season of Lent, right? And then we have the season of Easter, and we had Christmas, and before that we had Advent. Well, the basic structure of one year cycle was already present by St. Gregory the Great and the kind of general structure of the Mass. Now, gradually, more and more Christians throughout the West brought their local practices more and more in conformity with the practice at Rome, okay? Uh, so very often, people would, you know, they did their mass thing, like, like they'd always done, right? And then they're like, huh, so I wonder how the Pope does it. If it's good enough for the Pope, it's good enough for us, right? And so they go to Rome and see what was happening in Rome, and then they would copy uh, very frequently exactly what was done down to the, the exact kind of prayers that were used in Rome, and that kind of disseminated throughout the entire West. Now, originally, the liturgy was celebrated in Greek, which was the common language of Christians throughout the Roman Empire. Now, for reasons that are not entirely clear, Latin replaced Greek for almost all of the Mass by the fourth century. Now, some people, they, they look at this and they're like, well, it was the Roman Empire, people spoke Latin, right? So it was the language of the people. Eh. The Latin of the Mass is not the language of, you know, your fishmongers and uh, your, you know, politicians in the Senate. It's a very different register. It's a very different type of Latin than that. But it is Latin by that point. And the Mass was celebrated exclusively in Latin in the, in the Roman Rite of the Catholic Church until 1964. It was only in Latin. Now, there were a few special permissions to celebrate that Roman rite in other languages. In China, Hungary, Dalmatia, which is kind of part of Croatia, and the Huron Indians had these weird kind of special permissions. I find this stuff really fascinating. Um, and actually, I didn't have this in here, but I've also discovered that in Arabic and in Persian, there were variants of the Roman rite that were, that were celebrated 
in those languages as well. But for the most part, everyone kind of, you know, had that Latin. And some people look at this and, you know, they immediately want to quote scripture and, and, and uh, you know, and, and quote uh, the text about, well, you know, praising God in a foreign tongue. You don't know what you're saying. It's like, well, but the point of Latin is not that you don't know what you're saying, is that we actually have a common language that we do know. So, for example, Hebrew uh, is, is the sacred language for the Jews. Um, you know, the, the Muslims do their prayers in Arabic, right? So, for Catholics, Latin is an extremely important vehicle for transmitting the faith without all of the changes that happen in, in kind of contemporary languages. Now, and we'll talk about how eventually we have, you know, the vernacular in languages as well, but not quite yet. So by the time we get to the early Middle Ages, the early Middle Ages were marked by an impressive growth in our understanding and celebration of the Eucharist. Okay? Remember, by this point, you know, Christians have been doing this thing for about a thousand years. And a greater sense of reverence toward the consecrated bread of the Eucharist meant that the development of a number of things came about that were not as common in the first millennium, the first thousand years of Christianity. Okay, so first of all, the increasing sense of reverence toward the Blessed Sacrament meant that fewer people approached the altar for Holy Communion. So to such an extent that um, Lateran IV, okay, I don't know if we, you've talked about like these uh, things called ecumenical councils, right? So 21 times in the history of the church, all the bishops of the world have gathered together um, in response to specific pastoral needs and have issued documents. There's 21 of these like what are called ecumenical according to the whole world councils. And at Lateran IV in 1215, you know, the bishops of the world came together and they're like, okay, we got a problem. So everybody loves the Eucharist, which is fantastic, but no one's going to communion anymore <laughs> uh, because people were so reverent toward the Eucharist. They're like, well, I can't, I can't ever go to Holy Communion. I mean, this is, you know, this is Jesus Christ truly present. How can I do this? And so the church actually mandated in 1215 that every Catholic had to go to communion at least once during the Easter season each year. Sometimes you'll hear Catholics refer to what is called their Easter duty. It's like, okay, the minimum of being a Catholic is you at least got to go to communion once a year, right? If you're not doing that, then I mean, I'm not a Catholic, are you, right? Now, another thing that developed during this time, in order to avoid spills and irreverence, as well as in the time of plague, remember, you know, as, you know, all kinds of fun health things have been going around, the chalice with the precious blood, with the consecrated wine, was no longer given to the faithful, and communion began to be distributed under the form of bread alone. Uh, another thing that began to happen during this time, so the leftover consecrated bread, um, remember that, uh, you know, for Catholics, that is our Lord truly present. So we're not like, oh, we're not using that anymore, so whoosh, throw it in the trash can, right? I mean, that's unthinkable for Catholics, right? So that leftover consecrated bread up until, that, up until the, the high Middle Ages was usually put in a cabinet in the sacristy, right? Um, then it was kind of moved into a box in the church called the tabernacle, and those tabernacles became larger, more ornate, and eventually located on the altar of sacrifice itself, which then eventually kind of migrated its way toward the back wall of the church. That's kind of the historical progression of that. Um, now, with fewer and fewer people receiving communion, right, they had this great desire at least to see the Blessed Sacrament, to see the consecrated elements. So already by the 11th century, priests began to elevate the host and chalice after the consecration at Mass, right? So you go to Mass, you hear those words, this is my body, and the priest shows the host, hostia, the victim, right, uh, the consecrated bread to the faithful. Um, and that began to be considered like the highlight of Mass, was the consecration, because you can't have a mass without the consecration, right? So it's, it's not a mass then. Um, but that began to be considered to be the highlight of the mass and not communion, right? Because, I mean, you can go to mass, but you don't have to go to communion, right? So the consecration was considered more important than communion. Bells would ring, incense would be offered to Jesus Christ present in the Blessed Sacrament. 
And then eventually the host would be placed in a vessel called a monstrance. If you've been to our adoration chapel, you've seen that. And then carried around uh, in procession. Now, in the year 1246, um, a new feast, we talked about this calendar of the church year, right? Well, a new feast called Corpus Christi, that's the Latin, the body of Christ, was instituted after a Belgian nun, Juliana of Liège, um, had a vision of our Lord asking for a special, joyful feast in honor of his body. Well, one of the interesting things about our Catholic feast is that there's often kind of duplications of them, where we celebrate the same feast again, but with a different emphasis. There's something different about it. And so on Holy Thursday, right, it's the institution of the Last Supper, but we're plunged into the sadness of the Passion immediately. So our Lord, in this vision to Julian of Liège, says, I want a happy, joyful feast as well. And so that is the beginning of that uh, feast uh, of uh, Corpus Christi. And St. Thomas Aquinas, who is one of the greatest theologians of all time, composed all the prayers for the Mass and the Divine Office. That's the kind of prayers outside of the Mass that we say that include all the Psalms and readings and stuff. Okay. Um, all of this to say, to give you a sense of kind of this gradual awareness within the Catholic Church of the reverence owed to the consecrated elements of the Mass. Because this all goes back to a certain belief about what it is that we're doing and the reality of what happens to the bread and the wine at Mass. Now, so we're talking about all this stuff in the Middle Ages, right? We've got all this popular piety that's growing up around the Eucharist. But while all this was happening, there was also a lot of theological controversy around it as well. So now one of the most consistent things about the teaching of the Catholic Church is that Christians have believed in the real presence of Christ in the elements of bread and wine at Mass since the beginning, okay? even before the doctrines of the Trinity and the divinity of Christ were defined. Okay? I want you to think about that. So, you know, it was centuries before the official definitions of the divinity of Christ and the Trinity, and nobody doubted the real presence. It didn't even occur uh, to any Christian that there was a problem with this. Okay. Now, remember in the Middle Ages, you have this like beginning of kind of what we refer to now as like the scientific method, right? You have this scientific approach, which is very different uh, in intellectual development that was had until then. So you had people who started asking a question. Okay, so as Christians, we believe he's really present, but how is he present in the bread and wine of the mass when he's in heaven? Right? How does that work? Okay. Well, that was a question that, you know, in that form hadn't really been asked in the first thousand years of Christianity. And now everybody is asking this question, and it kind of deserves an answer, right? Well, the first person to introduce doubt into the equation was a man named Berengarius of Tours. Around 1047, he taught that the body of Christ was spiritually present in the bread and wine. Now, he recanted later, uh, but by that point, uh, all of a sudden, you know, this whole, like, floodgates was open to controversy. So the church defined, again, at Lateran 4, we're going to put Lateran 4 in 1215, the, uh, the doctrine, which is the longest Catholic word that you will ever need to know, transubstantiation, okay? And the definition of this doctrine was basically this, that the substance of the bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ while retaining their outward appearances. And in the kind of philosophical terminology of the time, those uh, appearances were called accidents. Now, not like, oops, I had an accident, right? You know, you got into a car crash, right? That, that, that's not the, the term. That's the, the philosophical term for those outward appearances of bread and wine. So the substance has changed, the accidents, the appearances stay the same. Now, fast forward 
you know, this whole question is still very much on people's minds, right? So the church has said transubstantiation, you know, inward substance changes, outward appearances stay the same. But when the Protestant revolt begins, all those controversies, of course, come back up. Right? Now, remember Martin Luther, okay, the first uh, kind of uh, main figure of the Protestant uh, Reformation. He called the Mass, the central act of Catholic worship, an abomination. And he said that the Lord's Supper is a sacrifice of praise. It is not an unbloody representation in ritual form of the one bloody sacrifice of Calvary. Now, Luther advanced that the real presence of Christ was due not to the church praying the consecratory formula, right? This is my body, this is my blood, but because of the faith of the believer, you see how this, this changes it considerably, doesn't it? It's no longer what the church does, but what the individual believes. And that the real presence was only relevant during the service and not outside of it. Okay? So do you need a tabernacle to reserve the sacrament then? No, because it's not there. The real presence isn't there after the service. Okay? So for Luther, the word that you know, began to begin to be used under, there's a dude named Melanchthon who was kind of his uh, systematic guy who kind of translated his stuff into, into stuff that was easier to kind of grasp onto, was the word consubstantiation, right? And that is that the bread and the wine and the body and the blood are all kind of present somehow, right? Now you can see that's, that's very different than transubstantiation. Right? Because one says the outward appearances say the same, the inward reality is the same. Consubstantiation is all kind of up in there. Right? It's all there. Now, then, of course, remember that Protestants multiply by dividing. Okay? That's, that's the nature of Protestant because of the, the idea of the individual interpretation of Scripture. And so then consubstantiation, well, no, I don't believe that either. So it begins to disintegrate all over the place into other theories. Calvin and Zwingli were even more radical, arguing that the bread and the wine were purely symbolic, right? Just as Jesus says, I'm the door, I'm the vine, I'm the bread, it's all symbols, right? Now, because of this, remember that where Protestants gained the ascendancy, then they did certain things to reflect their belief. So they ripped out tabernacles and altars out of churches and replaced them with simple dinner tables. Right? Because for them, the Mass is merely a memorial of Holy Thursday and was a meal. Okay? All of this other stuff, the Paschal Mystery, the Real Presence, Transubstantiation, uh, for all of them, the only thing that they're actually kind of all on the same page is, is that, is that the Lord's Supper was not all of this. Okay? Does that make sense? You can see how that completely changes the way that you build a church building, right? Or the way that you worship. Very different conceptions of, of what we do as Christians. Now, in England, you have a different world because Anglicanism actually left considerable latitude in beliefs in the real presence until the Articles of Religion in 1562 said transubstantiation is a vain thing repugnant to the word of God, right? So then Anglicanism officially kind of disavows um, transubstantiation. Now, I say that because I know that uh, some of you are Catholics who are kind of, you know, reconnecting with your faith at a different level. Some of you are coming from um, no Christian background at all, really. And some of you are coming from very specific kind of denominational confessions within Protestantism, right? And I personally was raised as a fundamentalist Baptist, Right, so like we were all over Zwingli, you know, we had uh, the Last Supper whenever the su there was a fifth Sunday of the month, and we had our little crackers and, and grapes juice, and we just kind of passed them around, and that was the end of it, and they just threw everything out at the end, right? So perfectly consistent with this kind of theology. And at a certain point, I began to think, well, there's lots of other Christians that do things very differently, so like, what is that? And then I discovered the liturgy, and so I became an Anglican. But as I kind of 
approached more the mystery of the Eucharist, then at a certain point, I'm like, okay, so what do I really believe about the same question that they had in the Middle Ages? Like, where am I with this? Like, I can't be a Zwinglian and a Lutheran at the same time, right? And I thought, well, Anglicanism leaves a little bit more latitude with this. And then I come across the Articles of Religion. Transubstantiation is a vain thing repugnant to the Word of God. I closed the Book of Common Prayer, and I said, I am no longer an Anglican. And so then I had painted myself into a corner, and the only place to go was the Catholics. So here we are, 31 years later. Now, remember that the Catholic Church you know, doesn't necessarily produce these kind of creedal statements right? until there's a doctrine which needs to be clarified and is under attack. Well, all of a sudden, the 16th century, like everything about the Mass, everything about the Eucharist, everything about the real presence is under attack from all sides. So... Um, the church finally produced a series of creedal statements about the Mass as the worship service and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And then it officially anathematized those who denied those doctrines. Anathema is a word which means let him be cast out. It's like if you do not believe these things, then you are not a Catholic. If you do not believe that the Mass is a true sacrifice, then I don't know what you are, but you're not a Catholic, right? So, so the church had to kind of clarify this. So we talked about those ecumenical councils. We mentioned Lateran IV in 1215. So the Council of Trent, which went on for a very long time because we had a lot to talk about. Um, the Council of Trent in 1551 issued a decree on the Eucharist. And the 1562, I forgot to put that up there, uh, on the sacrificial nature of the Mass. And this whole kind of teaching of Trent, which was, you know, in all these different documents and things, was then kind of consolidated into the Roman Catechism of 1569. Um, you, some of you have the copies of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, right? So they're in the pews as well. So the Roman Catechism of 1566 kind of provided the basis for Catholic teaching on the Eucharist until the Catechism was revised in 1992. Now, you know, the wording is different between, but the doctrine is the same, right? There's no, there's no difference here. Now, um, again, that newer version doesn't repudiate anything that comes from Trent, but it integrates into that teaching a fuller understanding of the place of the Eucharistic mystery in the context of what it means to be the church. Uh, and it, there's some beautiful passages in the Catechism, if you can read the Catechism about the Eucharist, about the Mass. I mean, it really is just quite splendid. Now, um, because of what happened with the Protestant Reformation, right, uh, and the church's reaction to it, then all of these controversies led to a certain overemphasis on the sacrificial ritual nature of the Mass as opposed to its aspect of being a communal meal. Okay? So I think of it this way. I mean, it is a meal, right? But uh, we reacted so violently to the Protestants saying it's just a meal that we kind of overcorrected to a certain degree. So in many places, the Mass was celebrated in a way in which there began to be this kind of disconnect between what the priest did at the altar and then what the people did in the pews. So the priest was saying his prayers, he was doing his Mass up here, and then the people in the pews, they were just praying. I mean, they were at Mass, but there was, a, there was beginning to be a disconnect between those two. Now, in the 20th century is this kind of movement within the church called the liturgical movement. And it sought to restore active, full, and conscious participation of the people in the sacred rites. And in order to do so, this liturgical movement proposed changes to the Mass to make it more accessible to the people of the time. So various kind of proposals were made, the use of the vernacular as well as Latin, um, and the simplification of the rites. Um, the fruit of this liturgical reform came forth in a new edition of the Roman Missal. That's just the book that contains the prayers of the Mass in 1970. Okay, so that was under St. Paul VI. Um, now, this kind of edition of the Mass, which we call the ordinary form of the Roman Rite now, um, was the work of a commission, 
okay, that replaced the ancient and venerable rite of the Roman Church, which had substantially been the same since the 6th century and then kind of organically developed over the ages. In 1570, Pope St. Pius V required the vast majority of Western Catholics to adopt the Roman Missal over against local usages as a sign of unity against the Protestants, right? So the idea is, okay, in the Middle Ages, you know, lots of people did what Rome did. Other places did something which was kind of similar, but now we got to get our act together. We got we to gotta all do the same thing and present a united front, not just in what we believe, but also how we celebrate Mass. Now, the beautiful part of that meant that you could go to any Catholic church in the world and every word was exactly the same. Every motion was exactly the same. To the extent that the, the, it prescribed that the priest, when he goes up the altar, goes with his right foot first. Right? So you didn't leave anything to chance. Now, the positive thing about this is that it was an amazing sign of unity. Right? The the difficulty of this is that transplanting all of that wonderfulness to certain places, you can't always just kind of take that and then plop it into the middle of the Amazon, for example, or to plop it into the middle of the Sahara Desert. And so the church, as she began to expand all over the world, you know, began to think, okay, so we've got to be able to, you know, be Christians and, and celebrate the Mass, but we got to have some flexibility here, which was part of this kind of liturgical reform. Now, the previous kind of way of celebrating the Mass, this kind of classical Roman rite, continued to be celebrated in a few places. And in 2007, Pope Benedict XVI issued a document called Samorum Pontificum, which clarified that the previous rite was never abolished. Okay. And the old rite would be called the extraordinary form, and the, and the new one would be called the ordinary form, and any priest may celebrate either form. Now, you guys are, are becoming a Catholic or reconnecting with the faith in a parish that actually celebrates both forms of the Roman rite. Um, there are four churches in all of South Carolina that do this. There are no churches that are exclusively the old rite, extraordinary form. Uh, there are places throughout the world that, that that's all they do. Uh, there are certain churches where that's all they do. Uh, we do both. Um, we are the only church in South Carolina that has both forms every day. Um, so it's a very unique place to be a Catholic um, because uh, remember when our Lord talks about, you know, bringing out of the, the treasure house treasures both old and new. Well, that's kind of our service to the universal church here at Prince of Peace is that we preserve all of the tradition uh, and do it as, as beautifully and as well as we can. But we also recognize that the ordinary form has been given to us by the church as well. And so we celebrate that. We celebrate it in English. Sometimes we celebrate it in Spanish. We celebrate it in other languages. Uh, we have parts of it in Latin. Um, and the school mass is half English, half Latin. So we go kind of back and forth between, between these rites. It's one of the, the beautiful parts of our, our particular parish. Okay, so we're, we're good up until, up until then. Okay. Now... When we talk about anything to do with the church, we always talk about doctrine, dogma, teaching, right? But we also talk about discipline. And the Catholic Church observes a number of common disciplines which are meant to foster devotion to the Eucharist, right? Remember that in the church, there are a lot of things in our life which are entirely up to the faithful to choose, you know, I mean, I kind of say jokingly, if it feels good, do it, right? Okay, so things that, you know, if this helps you grow closer to Jesus, then do it. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. The church has said, these are great things. Yay. Yay all those kind of spiritual practices. But the church also recognizes that there are certain disciplines that are binding on all of us so that we, as an entire church, can grow closer to the mystery that we celebrate in the Eucharist. So what are those? Well, first of all, all Catholics are obliged to attend Mass every Sunday or Holy Day of Obligation unless prevented by illness necessary work or impossibility, and that is binding on all Catholics under pain of mortal sin. Okay, so where does this come from? So the church considers attendance at Holy Mass one of the ways in which we observe the commandment of 
uh, Moses on Mount Sinai, keep the Sabbath day holy. Okay, so the Christian Sabbath is, is transferred from the seventh day to the eighth day, right? the renewed day, the day of resurrection, and Catholics go to Mass. Okay, now, um, we talk about illness. You know, sometimes you get Catholics, and, and I love them. They're wonderful because they, they really take this very seriously. They will be bleeding out of their eyeballs, and by God, they're going to Mass. And then you have to say, you know, you really know how to go to Mass, right? So the pandemic with COVID has completely, like, you know, uh, people think a little bit differently. But I remember before then, you would have people who were sneezing and hawking and everything else, and obviously contagious with something. And by God, they were not going to miss Mass. So... If there's any positive thing that might possibly have come out of the pandemic, because I, as Catholics, I'm kind of calmed down a little bit about that. Um, necessary work, right? You know, sometimes people have work that they can't get out of on a Sunday, right? Um, and you know, you do your best. Um, you know, sometimes I'll tell people, "Do you really have to have that job?" Yeah, okay, but um, but sometimes you've got to have hospitals, right? You have to have police. You have to, you know, these kind of things. Um, it's important to avoid unnecessary work on, on Sundays and, and holy days. Um, and especially if, if work is constantly getting in the way of, of, of going to Mass, then, okay, that, that's a problem. Now, you know, again, you know, is this a perpetual thing that is all the time, or is it, you know, the occasional, well, you know, I, yeah, I was called into the boss to work on Sunday, and it was, you know, from this time to this time, and I couldn't get to Mass. Okay, well, that's a whole different thing, right? Um, impossibility. Okay, you know, I had... Um, where I find this often with Catholics, you're going to laugh, is when they go on vacation and they realize, I got to go. I mean, we don't like skip out on Mass just because we're on vacation. But then sometimes you find yourself in an impossible situation. Um, I found myself in the middle of Turkey one Sunday um, where I couldn't get to Mass anywhere. And um, I couldn't get. I mean, because I said, well, okay, this is a weird thing to do, but maybe I at least get bread and wine and celebrate Mass myself. Great thing of being a priest. It's a Muslim country. I couldn't find a bottle of wine anywhere to buy either. So I'm like, crap, I've never missed Mass in my life. And here I am, you know. Well, it was impossible for me to go to Mass, right? I was literally in a city in which there were no churches of any sort anywhere. Okay. So now, second after that is the Eucharistic fast. Now, for most of Christian history, Mass was not celebrated after noon, uh, now it's kind of strange because we always think of you know the Last Supper, so we always joke about the, the you know the the Mass of the Lord's Breakfast. Um, but at, for many years, Mass was was not celebrated after noon, except on fast days, and then it wasn't celebrated after around three p.m. Um, and Catholics were obliged to fast from any food or drink from midnight before approaching communion as a physical sign of spiritual preparation. That's the ancient discipline of the church. Now, of course, the church also exists in time, right? So sometimes these disciplines uh, made a lot of sense for a particular like way of existence that just isn't there anymore. So think about the Industrial Revolution, right? The Industrial Revolution changed the way that everybody lived. And so the church responded by allowing evening masses for those people who had to work as well as relaxing the fast to three hours in 1953 and then one hour in 1964. Now, one hour before communion, not before Mass. So if you go to Mass at Prince of Peace, you could be chomping on a hamburger during the Kyrie and still actually probably make the communion fast, but there we go. Um, third, I don't have this up here, only Catholics who are in the state of grace and not conscious of mortal sin may receive communion, okay? You can't just get up there because everybody else is getting up there. That's not how this works, okay? Um, and the church bases her teaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 27 to 29. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Each one must examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Okay? The church takes this very seriously. Now, if you come to the communion rail, I do not have a spiritual x-ray machine to be like, mm, I know what you did, right? That's not how this works. Um, it is on you, right? to not come to communion if you are in the state of mortal sin. Remember what mortal means. It means, you know, death. So you can't feed a dead body, 
right? And so therefore, if your soul is dead by mortal sin, then you cannot be revived by the Eucharist. You have to go to confession, right? That revivification um, of baptism so that you're alive again, so that then you can be fed, okay? Does that make sense? Now remember, we're talking about mortal sin, right? Sin that kills the soul, not venial sin, okay? Which is lesser sin. And you talked about that with the confession class, right? So, okay, cool. Now, Another thing about this, you know, sometimes people, um, you know, they come to the Catholic Church and then, you know, they, they realize that they can't, if, if they're not Catholics, that they can't receive communion. And so they get very bent out of shape about this. That, well, Jesus wouldn't tell me no. It's like, well, he is here. So why? Why? Sacramental communion presupposes ecclesial communion. Okay. Why? Because we can receive at the table because we are one at the table. Okay? This is extremely important because remember that if you believe other things about the Eucharist, right, then what does it mean for you to come to communion in the Catholic Church? Right? You know, you're saying that it's something that it isn't. So it's offensive not only to your own belief, but to Catholic belief. Right? And when the, the, the minister says the body of Christ and we say amen, what that means is, is, is a profession of faith. I believe. I believe that it is the body of Christ. And not just the body of Christ as in the Eucharist, but everything that the church, the body of Christ, teaches. Right? And so that's why the point of you know, excluding non-Catholics from communion is to respect their beliefs. It's not you know, to be mean, nasty, and hateful. It's because, okay, you don't believe as we believe. Because if you did, you could not be a Catholic, right? So that's the idea. Now, this discipline of the Catholic Church is different than other churches, okay? Um, in most sectors of Protestantism, all of the baptized are invited to the Lord's Supper because for them it is a sign of God's love, right? Um, for us, one has to be in full communion with the church to receive communion because the Eucharist is a sign of unity in the body of Christ as we receive the true body of Christ. Okay. Um, for the same reason, Catholics are forbidden to receive sacraments in other churches and are discouraged from attending services in other churches unless there is a real need to do so. Okay, so your cousin gets married in a Baptist church. Okay, yes, you can <laughs> Yes, you can go to the church, um, but uh, you know you can't just kind of you know free range around wherever. Because again, what are you saying? What are you saying about your belief in the Eucharist? Um, you know, sometimes you have mixed families where like you know one partner is Catholic and the other is something else, and and so th they're like, well, I'll go to your church this Sunday, and then we'll go to your church the next Sunday. No, Catholics go to mass every Sunday. Right. Um, or they're like, oh, well, you know, I'm a Baptist and she's a Catholic, so we'll split the difference and become Episcopalian. No, <laughs> no, that doesn't make sense. Now, in some sectors of Protestantism, uh, and, and some of this is kind of more extreme versions of Lutheranism, um, the pastor alone can admit people to Holy Communion. In the Catholic Church, is the responsibility of the communicant, not the priest, to ascertain his own disposition to receive Holy Communion. Um, and no one may be denied Holy Communion unless they are a manifest public sinner or it is clear that they have evil designs on the Eucharistic species. Okay, so I got someone in, we know, with a t-shirt saying, Hail Satan, right? Uh, no, you're not receiving the Eucharist. Okay, why? Because I don't know what's going on here, but this, you're obviously not prepared to receive communion. Or you have someone who comes in who is just like, oh, it's a freebie, I'll go grab the freebie. No, <laughs> no. Um, it is very rare for a priest to deny Holy Communion to someone for the whole manifest public sinner thing. I mean, that's like a very serious thing that caused grave scandal to the entire faithful, and there's been a whole process of trying to engage that person. So I can't just be like, like, well, you know, I know what you did, so you know Jesus for you. It doesn't work like that, right? It's, there's a whole process behind it. Now, those are the kind of disciplines that are very important to kind of grasp uh, for, for Catholics that are part of our common ecclesial life. Now, all of this having been said, remember that the Orthodox, 
right, who kind of split from us in 1054, are in a little bit of a different kind of situation because they have valid sacraments, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and so, if you find yourself in the middle of Greece, in the middle of nowhere, and there's not a Catholic church, then you can fulfill your Sunday obligation by going to to Mass. Um, as far as we're concerned, you could receive communion there, but they don't want you non-Orthodox to receive communion. So it's kind of a moot point. Now, okay, so let's kind of begin to wrap, wrap this up, and then we'll have time for questions and things. Remember, let's go back to Luther. For Luther, all the Mass could ever be was a sacrifice of praise, okay? A human offering to God that did absolutely nothing to justify the soul. For Catholics... The Mass is essentially the bloody self-offering of Christ on Calvary in atonement for our sins, which becomes present in an unbloody manner under the veils of bread and wine. And we share the fruits of that sacrifice in the sacrament of Holy Communion. The Thanksgiving meal of the Eucharist is a true participation in the divinity of Christ, which transforms our humanity. But even as we eat the body and drink the blood of the Lord in the Eucharistic liturgy, we also extend our praise to God through adoration of the Blessed Sacrament as an extension of that sacrament and sacrifice. That is why the Eucharistic species are reserved in a tabernacle in the church, it's why a lamp is always lit before it, and why the bread of angels is placed in a vessel for Catholics to see to adore the Lord who is present behind the veil of the sacred host. So I know that's a lot to throw at you. Um, don't try to figure it out all at one time. Right? Remember, what we're doing is a mystery. Right? Um, I have been studying the history of the liturgy and the theology of the liturgy in serious depth for 31 years. And I'm reminded when St. Thomas Aquinas wrote the prayers for the Feast of Corpus Christi, um, greatest living theologian ever, right? Uh, amazing writer as well. Um, he wrote all this amazing stuff about the Eucharist. I mean, all the, the prayers for Corpus Christi and all this kind of stuff. And he has a vision of our Lord, and he says, everything I've written is as strong. Um, all of the beauty and the majesty and the grandeur of the ceremonies of the Mass, as wonderful as they are and as close as they bring us to Jesus, are still nothing compared with the reality that they signify. Um, I want to share something with you about the, the power of the Eucharist. Okay. You know, I, I mentioned to you that you know, part of my own journey towards Catholicism was an intellectual uh, search for an answer to the question, okay, how does he become present in the bread and wine when he's in heaven, right? Same question in the Middle Ages. And that's what led me to Catholicism. It was an intellectual thing. But when I walked into St. Mary's Greenville for the very first time, you know, I didn't know, I'd never met a Catholic. I didn't really know much about Catholics at all. I mean, I knew a little bit about doctrine and history, but that was about it. I knew that I was home, and I knew that I had to be a priest. And what was so beautiful is that in becoming Catholic, it means that you're at home in any Catholic church anywhere in the world. So um, sometimes when people come in from other churches, you know, they're like, well, I don't feel particularly welcomed in a Catholic church. And they're kind of off put by that. Because in many churches, you know, they try to love bomb you, right, to, to make you part of the community. And we just don't do that. And they're kind of like, gosh, you Catholics, are like, I mean, you don't really care whether I'm here or not. Well, that, that's not really the case. But the idea is that you're home. You, know, you don't welcome people to their own home. It's their house, right? So you have just as right to be there as anyone else, right? Um, sometimes people, you know, they're like, well, you know, my children are kind of rambunctious and I don't know if they could be at Mass. Why? <laughs> they kind of look at me. Well, they're going to act, who cares? I said, they have as much right to be there as you do, right? They're baptized Catholics and, you know, that's their home, right? Um, you know, you don't put the welcome sign out for people who are already inside of their home, right? Um, so it's kind of an interesting kind of perspective that may be different from the churches that you're coming to. And the other thing is, remember, and you, you'll hear this, me say this from the pulpit as well, the Mass, it's not about you. <laughs> the worship of God is not about you in any conceivable way. Get over yourself, right? It's not about you. If you think it's about you, then this is not the church for you because it's not about you. Now, there are other things that are about you, right, about the life of the church and all of that, but Mass is not about you, in, at all. It's all about the worship of God. 
And if we understand all of these things, then a lot of all of the other things in the life of the church make sense. I want you to think about the discipline of the celibacy of the clergy. Okay? That priests are required, in imitation of their Lord, to not be married and have children. Do you think that I would do that for a piece of bread? No way. No how. For Jesus Christ, the Paschal Mystery, absolutely. My parents um, were not happy when I became a Catholic. They were very opposed to it. I was very young and very obnoxious at the time. Um, you won't be surprised to hear. Um, and they thought I was making a huge mistake. And my father, wanted, uh, who was a very, very devout Baptist, wanted nothing to do with it. My mother's best friend in high school had been a Catholic. And so she w went to Mass at St. Mary's uh, in the 1950s with her friends. So she had some kind of understanding of it. But even she was like, I don't know about this. Um, both of my parents had deathbed conversions before they died to Catholicism. Uh, my mother was the first to go. Um, she had told me shortly before her death, she'd been sick for a while, um, she had this great love for John Paul II and Mother Teresa. Oh, weird for a Baptist lady, but there we go. Um, and she talked about Mary, the importance of Mary, and all this kind of stuff. Again, a little weird for a Baptist lady. And she expressed her interest in becoming Catholic, but my parents were in, a, from the Catholic side of things, an invalid marriage. Um, so that would have to have been fixed in this whole process. But, you know, in danger of death, all bets are off, right? And then her ex-husband dies, so it's fine. So... Um, so at a certain point, like, you know, she had expressed an interest in Catholicism. I had been ordained a priest at, by that point um, and was in Beaufort on the coast when I got the call that my mom um, was on her way to meet Jesus. And so, of course, you know, I you know, drop everything, I go up there. And my mom was already sick by the time of my ordination as a priest. So my mother had never seen me celebrate Mass. And so she was at St. Francis Hospital, the Catholic hospital downtown, and so I would go down into the chapel there every day to celebrate Mass and celebrate, you know, remembering her. Um, and my mom kept lingering, and it was like, you know, you know, sometimes when someone kind of lingers around, you're like, okay, there's some unresolved something going on here. And so I had a friend of mine, you know, a dear, dear friend of mine, uh, Priscilla Estrada, who used to be the pastoral associate here. And she said, she said, Father Chris, you know, your mother has never seen you celebrate Mass. Why don't you do it in the room? So I said, okay, well, so I brought all the stuff up and celebrated Mass at her bedside. And she had been, you know, received all, all the sacraments that she could, but, uh, you know, but the Eucharist, I mean, you know, she, how is this supposed to, to work, right? I mean, she was in a, in a coma. And so at the time of communion, I dipped my pinky finger in the precious blood and then put it on my mother's lips, and within an hour she was dead. She was waiting to receive the blood of her Savior that had redeemed her, that was shed in the holy sacrifice of the Mass through her son who was a priest. Now there's a beautiful Catholic tradition, you know, when a Catholic priest is ordained, one of the things that happens is that his, his hands are anointed with, with, with chrism, the fun smelly oil, right, as a sign that his hands are set apart to bless and to consecrate and to sanctify, right. Um, and the, the, there's a very pious Catholic tradition that, um, you know, you've got to get that oil off at some point, right, and so you take a linen cloth called a purificator and you wipe all of that yummy chrism onto the purificator, and that when your mother dies, that purificator is wrapped around her hands uh, in her um, uh, in her tomb, and so I was able to do that for my mother because you know she gave me to the church unwillingly, <laughs> but I was able to give her the the blood of Christ, and that was what she was waiting for for her ushering into eternity. Um, Fast forward, my father, uh, who many of you in this room were wonderfully helpful with, my father had uh, dementia and had a whole series of, of strokes. And uh, he was the one who was the most kind of not happy about me being a Catholic. Um, but the response of the Catholic community after my mother had passed really changed the way that he thought about Catholics, um, which was a beautiful thing. Um, and uh, 
at a certain point, you know, because again, you know, you're dealing with someone who is going in and out of various states of consciousness, so you never know quite what you're dealing with. And so I kind of was joking with my dad. I said, I said, well, you're hanging out with these Catholics all the time. You know, you better be careful. You might become one of us. And so my father said, said, well, I would really like that. And I'm like, is he having another stroke? Like, what's happening here? Like, what, like, what is this? And so I thought, mm, okay. I said, well, let's test the spirits here because I don't know. So I kind of let it go for a while. And then in a particularly lucid moment, he, he mentions this to me again. And so I'm like, let's do this. Like, you know, call for the, you know, to conditionally baptize him and to confirm him and all this. I'm like, okay, he's becoming a Catholic. But I still wanted to be able to give him Holy Communion. Um, but he, by this stage, he wasn't living at the rectory with us anymore. He was living in a care facility. And I'm like, you can't just like kind of whip out the Blessed Sacrament and give him, you got to kind of prepare for this. And so I was taking him to our kind of family Christmas celebration. And I said, okay, this is my, you know, this is my time. I can do this and give my dad his first communion. It's great. We're in the car because there's no other way that I can like make this happen. And so I said, okay, we're doing this. So I'm sitting here and I was like, I'm like, Daddy, do you want to receive Jesus in Holy Communion? Yes. And so I take the host, and I give my dad Holy Communion. He knew exactly what to do. And he received the Blessed Sacrament. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Honk, honk, honk. Someone behind me honking the horn for us to get out of the way. <laughs> so then I thought some very unholy thoughts. And put the car in drive, and I give him my, my dad on Christmas Day, um, his first communion in my car. Um, so there we go. Um, then, uh, unbeknownst to me, Deacon Bob and, and, and Carol and lots of people from the parish were bringing my dad communion like all the time uh, after that. So he received communion uh, all the way up to um, right before his passing. Um, and he died on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, which was also my birthday that year, in my arms. So I had the great blessing to see my parents uh, both become Catholics before they died. Um, my mother had a son from a previous marriage um, who was kind of estranged from the family in many respects. And um, we just didn't, it was one of those typical kind of, you know, broken family situations. And my brother was living with his partner uh, in Asheville. And he was actually going to the Basilica of St. Lawrence to the Adoration Chapel. So my brother was very sick at this point. He had had several strokes. I don't know what is with my family and all of this, but there we go. Um, and he was going with his partner to the Adoration Chapel. Didn't have the foggiest idea what this was, what the Eucharist was, what the Mass was. But it was a place of peace that they felt welcomed. Uh, now, you know, they were living in a lifestyle which was you know, not according to the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they still felt welcome in that place and this attraction of Jesus in the Eucharist. So my brother has another stroke, and he's uh, obviously like on his way out, and he calls for a priest. And so the priest uh, calls me and says, says, I've baptized and confirmed your brother and given him Holy Communion and uh, the anointing of the sick. Um, you just never know. The Eucharist, because it is the body and blood of Christ, is capable of transforming people's lives in incredible ways. I've seen that just in my own family. Um, what that has meant for my own family uh, in healing the divisions of the past, right? Because we were a divided family, religiously, um, morally, and but yet the love of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist was able to break through all of that stuff from the past, all the theological controversies, all the moral things, all of that, um, to bring about his plan for the salvation of souls. Right? So being a Catholic is a very interesting ride. You never know what this is going to be like. I'll tell you that right now. Um, but it's absolutely worth it um, precisely because of the fact that in the Mass we receive not just a gift but the gift giver himself. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. All right, so we have some time for, do we have some time for some questions and things? So yeah, about any, anything, but particularly related to the Mass and the Eucharist and, and all of that stuff. So and again, this is a lot to throw at you at one time, but you'll be learning about this for the rest of your lives. So you got plenty of time. <laughs>
everything totally clear, that's amazing. So, so yeah, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of stuff. So. Okay. Well, if there are other things that kind of occur to you, remember that um, you know you're always welcome to uh, you know to kind of sit down and we can kind of puzzle through, through these things uh, you know in a more private setting. Um, you know, either Father Tomlinson or myself. You know, we're always uh, happy to you know receive people in the office and just kind of you know go through things and all of that. So. Sure. Right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So, well, because of what we believe about the Mass, um, you know, it's not just us that are there. Um, the, like, all of heaven is present when we celebrate Mass. Um, and that's a tremendous thing. Like, sometimes, you know, I may be celebrating Mass by myself, but I'm never alone, if that makes sense. Um, which is a tremendous gift. Everything that's happening in the eternal uh, celebration of praise in heaven is happening every time we celebrate Mass, which is a beautiful thing to think about. Right, yeah. It's a beautiful thing. And also there are many miracles of the Eucharist. Um, right. Uh, Michael, Michael, yeah, well, th this is one of the, you know, <laughs> again, we, 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 I, I always talk about like weird Catholic stuff, right? You know, the things that really freak out people who aren't Catholic because they're like, what on earth is this? But one of the w cooler things that we have in the church are what are called Eucharistic miracles. And the, there's a number of them in different places in which for some reason something happens at Mass where something happens to the consecrated elements. Um, and then there's this kind of abiding miracle afterwards. Um, some of them are in Italy, Lanciano, there's Santarem in Portugal, where you know, one of the stories is you know, a priest was having doubts about the Blessed Sacrament when he's celebrating Mass, and he goes to, you know, to break the host, and then all of a sudden it turns to human blood in his hands. And he's like, oh, what is this? And uh, then all of a sudden, you know, blood begins to coagulate. So you have this like coagulated blood, which is like on the altar, um, which is, is like, okay, well, this is obviously something, right? And so then the church says that there are reasons to believe that this defies natural explanation, also known as a miracle. Uh, and they are held in these reliquaries that you can visit. Um, and some of them have actually had... Um, uh, scientific studies done on them and it's very strange like the blood type I mean and many of them that have been documented the blood type is the same and it's whatever it was AB is the universal donor so I mean there, there's lots of the same things that are present through all these Eucharistic miracles I mean it really is an incredible thing um, right right so, yeah, and they're from the same play. I mean, it's just, it, it's really interesting uh, that these Eucharistic miracles are there. Um, and, you know, whenever I have an opportunity to see one of the things, I'm always like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's, let's, let's do that. We did have a, a habit at, at this church um, several years ago. They had posters all over. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, with, with, with uh, photographs from uh, these places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a good book by, was it Joan Carol Cruz, which is called Eucharistic Miracles. Yeah. Uh, oh, right. And then there's the Bob and Penny Lord books, too. Yeah. Which kind of like document the ones that are kind of, you know, considered by the church to have a supernatural character to them. Um, you know, you, the church is always very skeptical about these things, right? Until the church can literally say there's not a natural explanation for this. Um, and, and the faithful are very uh, often, you know, their faith is very much restored uh, when they visit these shrines or when these things things happen. Um, and some of the stories are crazy. I mean, like, you know, somebody, um, you know, a witch who goes in to try to steal the Blessed Sacrament for a satanic mass, and it's like, it just starts bleeding as she's trying to take it out of church. And people are like, oh, God, what is this? And then she's converted instantaneously, um, you know, because of it. You know, I, I, you know, again, Catholicism is not boring by any stretch of the imagination. And these are the kind of, you know, the fun, the, the, the fun side of, of Catholic life that's part of all this, but, but yeah. Okay, sure. As far as like receiving the Eucharist, obviously mm -hmm. 
Correct. Yes. Okay. So if you are, I guess, insisting in receiving yeah. Eucharist, mm -hmm. are those sins still things that you need to necessarily mention in confession if they're forgiven through continuing Eucharist? Sure, sure. Well, remember that. Like yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. like sure, that, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. Sure, sure. Well, we hope not. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. So, okay, so when we talk about um, venial sins, right, um, there are various things which kind of uh, take away venial sins, right? I mean, uh, basically like anything that we do which is communion with God in any sense, our prayers, you know, things that we do for, for others, uh, and receiving Holy Communion uh, wipes out sin. Because remember that when we receive Holy Communion, we're receiving love, and so love is more powerful than, you know, than our sin. And so if it's a venial sin that hasn't killed the soul, then that, uh, you know, receiving communion is an act which uh, not only wipes away venial sin, but also kind of helps build up the soul so that we have more kind of spiritual resources to fight with to avoid uh, repeated sin or, or mortal sin in the future. Right? Now, and here's an interesting thing, and, and this is related to a question of the valid reception of a sacrament and the fruitful reception of a sacrament. So just bear with me because it's a little bit kind of technical. But you know, you can receive a sacrament validly, right? But it's not necessarily fruitful in your spiritual life. So what do I mean by that? Okay. So let's say that you just get into, and this can happen, right? Um, you know, think about how, you know, so those of you who are married, uh, you know, you're, you know, you say, I love you a million times a day. And sometimes you actually mean it, right? <laughs> sometimes it's like, there's like a whole thing that happens that you remember for the rest of your life. And it's beautiful and amazing and wonderful. And then there's other times where it's just kind of perfunctory, but it still means something, right? Um, with, the the reception of the sacraments, you know, sometimes it's valid, it happens, you've received Jesus, but yet it could be more fruitful because we can always increase our disposition to receive more of the graces that are part of the Blessed Sacrament, right? Um, so, you know, you can go up to, you know, receive communion and just kind of walk up there and, you know, receive communion. Well, you've received it validly, but it can be more fruitful in your life if you open yourself up to all of those graces and you really intentionally engage what's happening. So that's why I tell people, I said, you know, never just kind of, you know, come up to the rail because everybody's getting in line, right? You know, think about what you're doing, you know, pray, prepare for Holy Communion, make a thanksgiving after communion. Um, there's a saint, there was a priest named St. Marin, um, who uh, was, it was a priest in Lebanon, and he celebrated Mass every day at noon for a very particular reason. He wanted to spend the entire morning preparing for his encounter with Jesus and then spend the entire afternoon and evening in thanksgiving for that moment. And then he went to bed. Um, you and I can't do that because we're not monks on top of a mountain with nothing else to do but pray. But that spirit right, of engaging in in the fruits that come from Eucharistic worship uh, is something that we can do so that we don't just kind of take it for granted and do it perfunctorily. So, does that help a little bit? So, yeah. So, so, yeah so, well, right, okay. Sure, sure. You don't have to. You don't have to mention venial sins in confession. Right, right. Yeah, you don't have to mention venial sins in confession. You may. It's, it's a very great custom to do that because it's kind of part of your examination of conscience. You're holding yourself accountable before God. Uh, but you don't have to in that sense. So. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because remember, it's not a mathematical equation. You, know, you don't want to approach it, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, it, it is, you know, I, this annoys me when people say this. Oh, it's not, it's not religion. It's a relationship. Well, I mean, it's both, right? <laughs> so, and part of the relationship is that you know you don't, you, you don't approach the spiritual life as like you know ledgers of an accountant. You know, not that there's anything wrong with ledgers of accountants, but <laughs> so, um, but that's not kind of you know the idea of you know our sinfulness and, and grace in the life, kind of computing it in that sense. So, good, good question there. So, awesome. Other things that come together? Okay. I just need to yeah. question for people to email mm -hmm. me.
So, yes, you you have to go before you receive into the church unless you're being absolutely baptized. I'm going to try to so, get your mm-hmm. confession in before April 7th and make my life easier. <laughs> 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 so, yeah, because yeah, we absolutely have to make sure that you know, because again, you know, a dead body can't eat, so you know, you can't you know be received into the church sacrilegiously. That's not how this works. Um, so you want to get your halos polished before uh, you know coming to the altar for the for the first time. And I also yeah. highly recommend going to the Monday Thursday mass because mm-hmm. the way we do it here is pretty yeah. stellar. So you can, and it will help you. Seven p.m. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, you know, none of these things are obligatory, but I think that for Catholics, especially when you're coming into the church, um, to participate in as much of Holy Week as you can, you know, d- do whatever you can to do that. You get a sense of what of how Catholics celebrate the Paschal Mystery when you go to Palm Sunday, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, um, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. I mean, it really. It really is amazing to participate in all that. And, you know, I always say it's kind of like, you know, our Catholic Super Bowl. I mean, it's just it's the thing that we look forward to all year and is really amazing. And in this parish, we have the resources to pull off the ceremonies generally in an extremely beautiful way. Um, and we have people who come from other states to Prince of Peace uh, for Holy Week. Uh, because we we really do put everything into it, um, the ceremonies are very complicated and uh, they're uh, they're very beautiful though, uh, and so we spend a lot of time <laughs> to make sure that they go off well, uh, and especially during COVID we weren't able to do a lot of the things that we normally do, uh, and so now thank God you know we can you know kind of uh, go back to you know celebrating Holy Week with all of the you know the, the beauty and the the dignity that is. Um, proper to those celebrations. So, well, good. So, okay. Well, good night. <laughs> so, good to see you. So, yep. I'm-